My sermon this morning is entitled, Dying to Live. I love the way the mystics turn to creation to speak of the mysteries of life and death. They see this, this mystery of death in the ending of every day. Death is as certain and as normal as the setting of the sun. Endings are real. And resurrection is as sure and beautiful and reliable as the dawning of the next day. Each day ends. Every day ends. It is over, and we cannot stop it. A picture of death for us. And just as surely, a new day begins. A picture of resurrection and new life. Some mystics will describe dying and rising as the same rhythm as breathing. Breathe in to receive life. Go ahead, take a deep breath. It is life for us. And breathe out to let it go. The gospel quotes Jesus saying it is necessary to lose our lives, to let them go in order to receive them again. I drafted this sermon on Monday morning. It was only two pages long, but I felt like I'd said everything I needed to say. I thought this is going to be the shortest sermon TLC has ever heard from me. <laughs> and then I thought, people are probably okay with that. <laughs> but never underestimate the Holy Spirit. That evening, Susan and I invi were invited to Jordan, Minnesota, to friends that have about 20 some apple trees on their farm to press fresh apple cider. I was on a ladder with my head in an apple tree surrounded by literally hundreds of beautiful ripening fruit and this quotation came, anyone can count the seeds in an apple but only God knows how many apples are in a seed. I was reveling in this bounty and realized that when the gospel writer John tries to make the point of dying to live, he communicates this connection in a, with a much happier example. He says, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Casting seed is actually fun. There are few things I enjoy as much as planting a garden and the life it produces is so tangible and generous and beautiful. It's hard to believe all those vegetables are healthy. They're so sweet, but they are more than healthy. And besides that, a seed makes clear that growth is not merely more of the same. When a seed grows, it doesn't become a bigger seed. It becomes something very different than a seed though along the way will produce something that produces seeds again. So it is that life comes from dying. Dying to live. It is necessary for Jesus to suffer, be rejected and die for the new life of rising to be given. Those who keep their lives will lose them, but those who lose them will save it. My cousin's wife lost a sister this summer. I called her a few days after the funeral to see how she was doing. What a really good conversation. And at the end of the conversation, she said, Paul, next time I see you, I'd like to talk about death. How do we see death? What do we believe about it? Beneath her questions, I heard the question, how do we live knowing that death is true? I've been thinking what I'll say to her when we get to have that conversation. Um, I'm willing to give you time to say, what would you say to your cousin under these circumstances? I'm thinking I'm going to start with two observations. One is that Death is completely natural and utterly certain. All living things die. All living things die. There, 
There need be no surprise here. But the second thing is to say that when it comes, death is so much more final, awful, devastating than we can imagine, even when we're expecting it. Death threatens the meaning and the purpose and the goodness of life. This morning, Jesus is leading Peter and, his, and us through the contradiction of these two sentences. He says he's going to die. And what's more, he's going to experience the death of suffering rejection, being abandoned by his friends, falsely accused by worldly powers. And Jesus reveals perfect trust in the face of death's certainty. Jesus shows us here that he is absolutely one of us. He will face everything that we face. And he gives us the gift of his leadership. He goes before us into these depths and mysteries. We are disciples, that means followers, and we get to follow his path already laid before us. All of this is to say death is real, a very real part of life, and Jesus alone lives toward it without fear. I'm so grateful for his companionship and his leadership ahead of us. Peter embodies the other truth about death. This is the most threatening and awful thing he's ever heard Jesus say. So he says, no, it can't be true. I will not allow it. He reacts to the fear and the pain. Peter shows us that he is us. Which of us doesn't react to the fear and pain? He expresses the devastation we feel. It's a huge gift that Peter meets Jesus here. And it's a huge gift that Jesus will not let Peter stop him. I believe there are at least two reasons for the devastation. One is that when someone we love dies, we lose a part of ourselves. And the second is, each loss, each time we hear of death, this is a reminder that someday the grim reaper will come for us, too. It is even more certain than taxes. Jesus won't let Peter stop him. He rebukes Peter. In fact, he calls him Satan, enemy, opposition. But when Gethsemane and Calvary come, Jesus, too, is candid about the fear and pain and forsakenness. And then in Mark's telling of this mystery, Jesus does a most astonishing third thing. He gives a whole paragraph about how facing death, surrendering to the truth, is a way to live. In fact, is the way to live. Those who want to save their lives will lose it. Those who will let them go who will surrender to the fleeting unrepeatability of this day will gain life. As paradoxical and contradictory as it sounds, dying is a way to live. We know that breath is essential to life, but if we decide we're going to hold our breath because letting it go could kill us, we discover that the exact opposite is true. Life is trusting that the next breath will come. And it is the freedom to let go of the breath you have now. Our daily serving and trusting is a practice for the big step at the end. When Jesus says letting go of our lives, I think he's talking about letting go of our egos. The, the enemy in us that's going to say, oh no, I'm bigger than that. I can, I can do better than that. And I don't think death is too strong a word for what happens to us when the ego collapses. But there's good news here. 
It's only the beginning of the life God will give. So the Benedictines teach, remember every day that you're going to die. They teach this not at all to be morbid or sad or downtrodden. They teach it because knowing our days are fleeting helps us know what really matters while we live, which is to say, the day matters. Here and now, and the person next to you matter. Their need for your love and your need for them all matter because someday, my friends, we're all going to be dead. But today, we're alive. And if we'll, if, if we'll know that it's fleeting, we'll know more deeply how precious and good and wonderful it is. So discipleship is serving. It is letting go of life and leaning into the promise that rising newness comes. The height of irony, we are more valuable when we become less. As the church in our day is diminished, I worry some about how this counterintuitive story will be kept alive, dying to live, letting go to receive, releasing to save our lives. But the Bible is full of countless stories that give tangible expression to this mystery. We have the Good Samaritan stooping in a ditch for a stranger he doesn't even know. We've got the woman frantic about the lost coin. We've got Martha confronting her own grief and fear to help us remember letting go of life is living. It's like seed. Writing this sermon was so good for me because I remembered that the truth of this mystery is embedded in every dusk and dawn. It's as basic as a day ending and then a new one starting. It's as basic as breathing, letting go and receiving the miracle again. And it's as beautiful and bountiful as a seed. The danger is not that this story will not live. This truth, we die to live, lives all around us. The danger is not that the story won't live, but even that those of us who know it and love it will fight it, ignore it, or cease to live it. Life is casting seed, and it is becoming seed. I feel called to it in a brand new way today, and I hope you do too. Giving ourselves away, which is also known as love. There's a generosity and freedom here that death cannot destroy. All of this is summarized in a prayer we cannot pray too often. Your will be done, God. Your will be done. Jesus doesn't just tell us to do this. Jesus does it first and leads us still. I, he, I hope he, he, he helps us follow and frees us to give our lives. Amen. I, um, I had planned to give a commercial, but after Mary's lovely words, I hardly need to. Mary, the next chance to learn is today. We're starting a Bible study on Galatians. And I realized when I ended the sermon, so here's one more thing that I ended with freedom. One of the last studies was people in the Bible who are praying. And, and I thought they demonstrated the freedom of prayer. And one day, a very sharp student came to me and said, but Paul, what is freedom? And I said, oh, maybe we should read Galatians in the fall. And when we're hearing so many contradictory, vociferous claims about what freedom is in our country this fall, I think it'll be really helpful to hear what the Bible thinks about freedom. So we're going to meet right over here, 1045, as Mary said, bring your coffee. We'll have fun, got some good jokes, some fun examples, and some very vexing mysteries, and you're all welcome. No prior Bible study is needed. <laughs>